welcome to Envoy, where we are a people following Jesus to those not yet. It's good to have you guys here with us. Uh, uh, the madness has officially begun, and by that I mean March Madness has officially begun uh, this past weekend. For those of you all that care about the games at all, which I am one of those, uh, I do have to make a confession to you guys. Um, I, uh, I lied to you, um, and here's how I lied. I, I told you all in the previous weeks as we were talking about this that that is a kind of madness that I can handle. However, watching my team lose in the first round of the tournament uh, to a 14 seed, I, I got to let you all know that I had a real hard time with that, all right? I had, to, I had to go for a three-mile run in the dark to be able to deal with that. And so I do just want to thank you all, um, those of you that cared enough to be able to do a well check on me. Thank you all for, for doing that. I, um, I feel like I'm almost recovered. The, the, the twitching is almost gone. And so, uh, no, so joking aside, um, um, I, that, that's fun. But the reality is, is that kind of madness, if you want to get out of it, you just turn off the TV, Right. You get it off, right? But we're talking about a different kind of madness uh, in this series. And over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about the madness that's like, is our life. The madness that kind of we embrace, uh, whether we want to or not. The kind of madness that consumes our thoughts and our minds and our lives. Uh, and so over the several, uh, like the past three weeks, we've, we've talked about a couple different types of madnesses uh, that kind of sneak up on us. And they're madness because oftentimes uh, we end up doing the same thing over and over again to try to avoid the madness and it only sinks us in there further, which is ultimately the definition of insanity, right? And so the, the, the idea behind this is that ultimately, if there's a God who loves us and he understands the madness that we live in, that he's good enough to be able to offer some kind of solution or prescription to get us out of that madness. I happen to believe that the scriptures tell us what those solutions are. And so we've been looking at some of those things the last couple of weeks. We've been looking at the madness of relationships and how every single relationship that we're in, um, it, like it's frustrating. It gets challenging. It gets difficult. But the scriptures tell us that the solution to the madness of a relationship is selflessness, whether that's, you know, a spouse relationship or with your kids or with your boss or uh, any, any, any other person that you're in, thinking about them more than yourself, humbling yourself and lifting them up, like putting yourself on the back burner and putting them on the front burner. That, that's actually the solution to be able to get out of the madness. And it's, it's what Jesus has actually demonstrated for us. Uh, we also talked about the solution to the madness of money. And we talked about how it can so easily consume us and how Jesus has pitted um, God against mammon, the power uh, of, of money. And he says, you can't serve both, right? And so uh, instead of holding on to it more, what we're supposed to do is actually give it away. The solution to the madness of money is actually being generous to live open-handed and give it away. Uh, the, the last week we actually talked about the solution to the madness of control is actually surrender. We want to hold on to it tighter, but God says, give it to me because you don't have control anyway. So how about you bring your worries and your anxieties, which are ultimately indications of control in our life in the first place. And, and in exchange for that, I'm going to give you my peace which is what you're really looking for in the midst of control anyway. You go back and watch some of those messages unfold a little bit. Today, we're actually gonna be talking about another source of madness in our life. And we're gonna do that a little bit of a roundabout way. So hang in there with me. I promise that we'll get there and it'll make sense at the end. But the first thing I want us to do is I want us to actually stare at a couple of words. Now, these words will come up on the screen. They are rebellion and restriction. And so uh, just initially, what I want you to do is in your mind, I want you to think about what what comes to your mind, you know, with, with regards to rebellion and restriction? What, what are kind of your mentalities when you hear these words? What are you thinking? Now, um, ultimately, when you take a look at these words, what I want you to do is figure out which one of those is more appealing to you. Which one do you gravitate to more? Now, if, if, if any of you guys are like me, uh, you'll gravitate more towards the rebellion side of things, all right? Because ultimately, we can make a case for being rebellious. We can find reasons for rebellion. Uh, for that matter, our country is founded on rebellion, right? Amen? God bless America. Yeah, like, we, like we're founded on rebellion. I mean, the, the reality is this. It was the rebellion that took down the galactic empire in Star Wars, right? We, we, we actually resonate with rebellion. Even though the word might sound kind of negative, we find reasons to be able to do it. To some degree, rebellion is kind of sexy. It's a kind of instinctual. It's kind of what we, we gravitate to, especially when we find something that's not right or something that challenges us or somebody who tells us what to do, right? All of a sudden, there's something inside of us that wants to push back and rebel against. And so appealing wise, we actually gravitate more towards the rebellion side of this because no one likes to be restricted. 
Like we don't like that word. We don't like how it works in our lot. We don't, we, we don't like to be restricted or confined. Don't give me a curfew. D- don't tell me how fast I should go. Don't make me get a shot or wear a mask, right? We rebel against these things. To some degree, it's the restrictions in our life that cause us to rebel, isn't it? Anytime somebody tells you what to do, what not to do, when to do it and how to do it, there's something American in us that we then make Christian and says, no, I don't want to do that thing the way that you're telling me to do it. If the only reason why is because you just told me to do it, right? And if you don't believe that that's the case, have a kid uh, or, or, you know, those of you that have kids, you, you guys get this. It is a natural instinctual thing for us and others to kind of push up against um, the restriction. We just do this. Now, uh, I had the privilege of sitting with uh, Police Chief Vasquez, uh, the Police Chief of Colorado Springs the other day with the, uh, uh, several other pastors here in the area. And it was, uh, we've been sitting with different civic leaders and it's been great to be able to hear from them. Uh, really like this guy. He's got a, a great intentions for our community. Uh, one of the things that he told us that he emphasizes with his officers is that he, he uh, through all, all their training and throughout their stuff that they do, he emphasizes that they are first and foremost civil servants. That's what they are. That's their role as police officers. We're, we're civil servants. Um, so when they get a call, they are responding to service. That's what they're doing every time. And I, I love that mentality. I love that mentality. But, but as I'm listening to him, he made a statement and I, and I had to kind of laugh at this statement because I, I, I think it's actually true. He said, you know, we are civil servants and so are firemen, firemen and firewomen. Like they're civil servants as well. But firemen... Like everybody loves firemen because they don't show up to potentially restrict or take away your freedom, right? That's the difference. I think there might've been a little jealousy going on there. It is, it is hard, right? But, but that's the difference. Like we're both civic servants, but like only one of us come, you know, to save the day. The other one comes to take away your freedom or somehow restrict it. Now, personally, I gotta tell you, I love police officers when they are trying to keep me safe by restricting other people's freedoms, I don't particularly like it whenever they are trying to keep other people safe by restricting my freedoms. Like how fast I go, right? (laughs) And I think we all have that kind of relationship with this, this, this concept of restriction, right? We don't like other people to have that power in our life. We don't like to be restricted by things. Now that gets us to what we're actually talking about today because the madness that we're gonna be examining today is the madness of bondage. Now that doesn't make sense to you yet and I get it okay because ultimately what we're actually talking about is how we pursue freedom that's where we get the madness in because like none of us want to be in bondage I don't think I've got to convince any of you guys that bondage is bad not a single one of you guys woke up today going you know I think I would like to be addicted to something today right I'd like to be you know bonded to something today I'd like to be imprisoned to something like we don't think that way so like none of us think that bondage is bad. I mean, all of us think is bondage is bad. I don't need to convince you of that. But the way that we go about escaping our bondage and receiving freedom is actually the point of our conversation. It's what needs to be discussed because one way ultimately leads to more madness and the other way is seemingly mad in itself. And so today what we're talking about is the madness of bondage through pursuing freedom by rebellion or pursuing freedom by restriction. Now, this still doesn't make sense to you just yet, but I'm gonna actually direct you all to a passage of scripture that's gonna shed some more light on this today. And we're gonna have some further conversation about that. So Romans chapter six, you can go ahead and open up your scriptures, turn your your Bibles uh, to Romans chapter six. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna have some conversations around our table because here at Envoy, we truly believe that when you get a chance to read the Bible for yourself, the the word of God is powerful and God will reveal certain things to you today through your own reading that he might not reveal through my teaching. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a time where we read through these nine verses together around these tables. So you're gonna have to kind of bunch up with some people around there. I'd love for you all to read this together and then answer these two questions. One, what does this tell us about bondage? And then two, how do we experience true freedom? So I'm gonna give you guys about five minutes, find some people to gather together with and go ahead and read this passage.
All right, guys, I'm going to bring you all back here. I am uh, I'm absolutely confident that you didn't have enough time to be able to discuss um, those things thoroughly. And so for that, I do apologize, but I do want to remind you that um, one of the things that we kind of uh, talk about as kind of a priority here is like we want to help you engage and be equipped, but ultimately we want to start the conversation for you. We want to begin the discussion. I would encourage you guys to go back and read through this passage again and again over the course of this past week because there's a lot to be able to unpack there. And even today in our conversation, I'm going to walk through a couple of phrases and verses that, I, that stood out to me that I want to highlight um, but like, we're not going to have an opportunity to really unpack everything that's there because this is like some rich stuff that's going on in there. But for the purpose of our conversation today about this, this madness of bondage, we're going to have some conversations. I want to I draw your attention to verse 16. Um, for some of you guys, many of you, this, this probably jumped off the page at you. And if it didn't, I don't want you to overlook it because I think that this is an incredibly novel idea. Sometimes we look at the scriptures and we're like, okay, do I believe that this is God's word or not? And I think we should, you know, be able to make that determination. But other times we look at the scriptures and we go, I'm really challenged with whether or not that's just true. Is that a true statement? And so I want you to listen to this uh, statement here in verse 16. It says, you have become a slave to whatever you choose to obey. Isn't that a novel concept? Isn't that a novel thought? I remember the first time actually hearing this, I was an intern at a church um, in college. And, uh, and I remember reading through this particular passage and reading that. And all of a sudden it was just like, boom, my mind is blown in regards to how I even view freedom at all. Because if this is actually true, if Paul's words are, like, are being spoken that are true, um, like, then this changes kind of my whole perspective on life and my pursuit of freedom. Because it says, you become a slave of whatever you choose to obey. If that's true, what it means is you are a slave regardless. You just get to choose who your master is. You start to think about that and you go, I, that's actually a really true statement. I get to choose what I do. I get to choose how to live my life. I get to exercise as free will, if you will. But ultimately, whatever I'm choosing, I'm binding myself to. I can either choose to bind myself to rebellion or I can bind myself to restriction. Later on in this particular passage, it says, I can bind myself to sin or I can bind myself to righteousness. I can bind myself to this world or I can bind myself to God. But I'm a, I'm a slave Regardless, you just get to choose your masters. Man, that is, a, that is a really profound thought that helps to kind of set the stage for the rest of this and help us understand what the solution and prescription of this is in the first place. Because whether or not you know it, you are a slave to whatever you choose to obey. So later on in verse 20, it actually talks about one side of that. You can choose, you can choose to obey sin, right? You can choose to obey rebellion, but what is the result of that? In verse 20, it says, it, when you do that, you're actually free from the obligation to do what is right. That's a, that's a really interesting statement to me because when we choose to sin, when we choose to rebel, when we choose our own selfish actions, what we're doing is, is we're saying, I'm not bound to the obligation of doing what is right. And you're absolutely, like, you're absolutely correct. You are not bound to be able to do the things that are right. But of what benefit is that to you? Where has that ultimately gotten you? When, when you chase after the things that are not of God, the things that are not right, righteousness, the things that are outside of his boundaries and restrictions, like what does it result in your life? Are you proud of those things? Are you ashamed of those things or those things that you want to be able to share with other people? Because my, my feeling is this, that when we've gone outside of those boundaries, when we've gone outside of the restrictions and we've rebelled, it's caused heartache in our life. It's caused dissonance in our relationships. It's caused bad things to happen. So yeah, I'm free from the obligation of doing what is right. But like, what good is that? In, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, you are free, yet you are God's slaves. Really interesting concept. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. I think that's what Paul is trying to get after in this very passage. You are a slave to whatever you choose to obey. But if you choose to obey your impulses and you choose to obey sins, you know, pulling on your life, like where is it going to take you? And you actually think that you're free, but you're not actually free. As a matter of fact, 
you're actually less free than what you thought you were in the first place. In verse 18 and verse 22, it does this kind of comparison thing. Uh, not unlike what we talked about a couple weeks ago when we talked about uh, when Jesus took two things and he pitted them against each other. He says, you cannot serve both God and mammon, right? You cannot serve both God and the, and the pursuit of money. You can't pursue them both at the same time. You gotta choose one or the other. Here, he gives us this imagery of slavery and he says, you are a slave to whoever you obey. You can either be a slave to God or you can be a slave to to sin it's one or the other but you're a slave either way you just get to choose who your master is now be careful though because one way leads to further bondage the other way leads to true freedom one way seemingly is exercising our freedom but leads to more indebtedness the other one actually gets us what we are truly looking for but it seems so counterintuitive to our life now, you all need to understand that from the earliest stages of Christianity, the, the, the first adapters to this, the first disciples and the apostles, the ones who wrote these books that we now have as our scriptures, they understood this concept, that they were not free to do as they will. They were free to choose their master, and they chose Jesus as their master to do what he has said and the ways in which he told them to follow. We see this, by the way, in many of those guys, that they opened up their books that they wrote. Take a look at this, right? We see in Romans chapter 1.1, 1, 1, it says, this letter is from Paul, who is a what? A slave of Christ Jesus. And we see this again in Philippians chapter 1. This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. James chapter 1, this letter is from James. What is he? A slave. In Second Peter, we see Simon Peter writing this thing as a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And in Jude 1, 1, we see this letter is from Jude. What is he? A slave. Are you all seeing any kind of common denominator here? You see, each and every one of these Christ followers understood their identity from the very beginning. And they weren't ashamed of this identity. It was not contrary to their nature. As a matter of fact, they actually saw this as being the way to receive true freedom. They sought freedom through the restriction of actually enslaving themselves to Christ. And so the the solution to, the, the scriptural prescription to, the madness of bondage is actually slavery. I know that that seems so, so counterintuitive to us. But, but ultimately, that's the truth that we see in Scripture. That's what we see through this passage. And later on, we're going to see through the words of Jesus. Submitting to God and the restrictions or boundaries that he's placed on our lives is actually the way to true freedom. It may seem like madness, but this is the way. This is the way. We, we often feel so restricted by the commands of Christ and the rules uh, of, of Scripture. Uh, like, like, why is God trying to restrict our freedom? Why is he trying to spoil our fun? That, that's probably something that you or some friends of yours have said in your life, right? You've probably thought about this as you look at the, the rules, the laws, the regulations, the book, right? And it's like, I got to follow all of this stuff. Like, that seems so overwhelming and seems like, like a terrible way to live, Right? I would venture to say that that many of your friends or coworkers who are not yet following Jesus would probably adopt some kind of mentality that Christianity is a straitjacket, right? It's something where you just have to follow the rules and follow the lines and the guidelines. It's so restrictive. It's so confining. Why would anybody ever want to follow a religion or a person like that? And And I can see I can see how that would be distorted in their minds. I can see how they would come to that conclusion. But, but are these restrictions, are they actually meant for bondage to us? Or are they meant to actually be boundaries for us so that we might actually be able to experience things to the very best that God has created for us? I think that's a question that we have to wrestle with when we come to this place. And so like, let's get real practical about this because some of those rules and regulations, some of those scriptural commands and instructions, we look at them, other people look at them and they're like, man, that's so restrictive. So like, take a look at it on the side of sexuality, right? Sex is meant only in the confines of marriage. We see that throughout scripture, but that, like how restricting is that? Like we don't want to be able to live like that. That's so narrow and limiting the world around us says. Instead, we want to do it our way. And so instead of following the restrictions, we actually rebel against the rules, right? And and ultimately, we subject ourselves in this rebellion to pornography and promiscuity and pleasure-seeking, thinking that that somehow is going to give us the freedom that we ultimately want in our sexual lives. 
But those of you that have experienced this and those of you that have seen friends and family members experience this side of things, you realize that they're not actually getting what they were after in the first place. You see, deep down inside of us, we are created and we have a deep desire for intimacy. And what we end up doing is we end up short-circuiting, we end up short-cutting the process of, of intimacy and we exchange it for something that is far less than what we were after in the first place. And what we end up doing is we end up binding ourselves to the sexual sin that ultimately, in many cases, creates addiction and, and like, less, like less, loss of satisfaction. All because we rebelled against the restriction. When the restriction itself was actually meant so that we might be able to experience this thing that God happened to create in the first place to the very greatest of his extent. Now, I, those of you that have experienced this, like, I don't need to like, convince you of this because you know that this is true. You've gone outside of the boundaries and what you have found is that you've found bondage. Those boundaries were actually created for our benefit. But we see this in other areas of our life. We see this in areas of substance as well. You know, we're supposed to do things in moderation, only supposed to do things like drink alcohol and eat food in moderations and use drugs accordingly. Those are the restrictions, right? But where is the fun in that? God is such a party pooper. Every party needs a pooper. That's why we invited you, God, right? So like, why are you just like pooping on our parade here? Where's the fun? So restrictive, so we rebel. We rebel against that, right? And we, we take up, you know, um, in, in, like some mentalities like, let's eat, drink, and be merry, right? Because this, is, this life is short, and that's the way to, to express our freedom. And what we think, what we think is that we are exercising our freedom when we rebel against these things. But what we're actually doing is exposing ourselves to the chains of addiction. In each of these areas that we're told to have in moderation, is it possible that God gave us those places of moderation and those cautions for our own good? Because when we do those things in excess, all of a sudden we find ourselves actually in chains to those very things that we thought were somehow going to bring us joy and satisfaction. Now it's the thing that's weighing us down. It's the thing that we go, man, I wish I would have never gotten to in my life. Many of us understand that those addictions and those bondages have negatively affected both your dreams and your aspirations and your relationships. All because I thought I was going after freedom, but you ended up finding bondage when the boundaries were actually created for our benefit. But, uh, like Stuff. We look at our stuff. The, the scriptures have all sorts of st things to say about our stuff. Don't have any idols or give your focus to the things of this world. You'd be wise to set aside at least 10% of your income and see yourself as a steward of his stuff because it's not yours in the first place. So don't get distracted by the pursuit of the things in this world. Those are the restrictions. Those are the guidelines. Those are the boundaries. But you know, we have dreams and aspirations of our own. We have things that we'd like to do and things that we'd like to accomplish. We have troubles in our life that we'd like to ignore and get distracted from. So don't tell me how to use my time and my talents and my treasure. The rebellious side of us. Don't tell me how to use my stuff. I don't want to hear it. I want to use my stuff the way that I want to use it because I worked really hard for it. But it ends up actually creating bondage and chains when those boundaries were actually set for our, our benefit. What if, what if these restrictions were actually meant to help you experience the very best that God has designed and to keep you from falling prey to bondage and addiction? What if, what if God actually knew what he was talking about, <laughs> right? What if God actually loved you enough to give you instruction? to set things in place and to let you know how he's created it and how he's designed it because he cares about you and he wants you to experience the good things in this life. I think about this all the time with my kids. It's like, I love my kids to death. I set a bunch of rules and regulations for them, right? And to which, the, again, their human nature is to kind of push up against it, rebel against it and ask the questions why. Sometimes I have good questions for it, answers for it. Other time I just say, because I said so, right? But I do those things and I set certain limits and boundaries because I love them and, and I want them to benefit from them. And I know they're going to be rebellious to that. And I know they're going to step outside of those boundaries. And I know that they're going to suffer the consequences, but I don't want that for them. I think God looks at us the same way and he goes, let me love you enough to show you exactly where these lines are. Not so that you would be restricted, but so that you would truly be free to experience things the way that I have created them. Freedom, therefore, is not the absence of limitations or constraints. 
True freedom is restricting yourself to righteous restraints that ultimately liberate you. Ultimately set you free. Jesus had something to say about this that I want to take you guys to. It's recorded by one of his best friends and, and, and faithful disciples, John. And it comes from John chapter 8. And so if you've got your Bibles, you can open them up. Otherwise, you can take a look at the screen here. Let me walk you all through this real quick. Because Jesus said to the people who believed in him, these were, these were followers of him. These were people that were there, right? He says, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. Now, Jesus echoed this same sentiment in several different ways. Later on in the New Testament, we see this being echoed in different ways. That basically, the, 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 the premise behind this whole thing is, if you obey what I say, you're actually my disciple. You, if, like, if you love me, you'll do what I tell you. If you're actually following after me, you're going to believe that not only am I your, your Lord and your master, you're actually going to do what I say and think that what I say is actually best for you. And so when he says this, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, what he's saying is, is obedience is required. And obedience is a restraint because obedience means that you are submitting to the will of someone else. You're choosing to listen to somebody else. It's restrictive. But let me remind you, you are a slave to whoever you choose to obey. Jesus happens to be a really good option, all right? He actually might know what he's talking about. He might actually be able to help give us clues to how he created us in the first place. And so he goes on then to say, and you will know the truth and the truth will what? Set you free. How many of you guys have heard that phrase? You've heard that verse. You probably quoted it to other people. Some of us have said this, but not known the context in which this was being said. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free is directly in correlation to this previous statement that you are my disciples when you obey what I say. If you actually trust that what I say is true, then what I say and you do will set you free. Isn't that an amazing thing? What I say and the restraints that I put, if you actually follow those things, it's going to lead to freedom. That's the truth that's gonna set you free free it's an amazing thing what we need to understand is that every truth claim of God is ultimately countered with a lie from the devil everything that God says is true is going to be countered with a lie from the devil and oftentimes it's not like God says this and the devil says this it's that God says this is true and the devil kind of just yeah just veers off to the side a little bit have you experienced that in your life have you seen this in scripture we've seen this right You know, we're tempted to say boundaries that are good and lead to freedom are always countered by rebellion that leads to bondage. That's how it works. We see this in the early chapters of Scripture when when, when the devil is in the garden with with Adam and Eve. You You all see how this plays out? You see, what ends up happening is God says, hey, Adam and Eve, I've created all this for you. This is all yours. You can eat from any tree that you want to. You know what the one tree that the devil focuses on is? The one that they can't eat from the one that they're restricted from, right? And what does he incite in them? Rebellion. Rebellion. But, but he does this in a nuanced way. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't tell them, hey, rebel against God and eat from the tree. What he does is he, he, he tempts them with truth and wisdom and knowledge, which is actually kind of true what he says. But the consequences that they end up suffering is not exposed at that point he just veers off of the truth just a little bit and says oh god doesn't want you to eat from that because then you'll truly know wisdom and knowledge of good and evil right and so what do they do they rebel they rebel thinking i'm gonna exercise my freedom and eat from this tree and what's the result death bondage separation from god in the early stages that's how the devil has operated you see we forfeit our freedom when we sin because sin takes it away from us yet binding ourselves to Christ is freedom when we willingly forfeit our freedom unto Jesus he gives us true freedom which is what he ends up saying later on here in this this passage because the people respond to this whole you'll be set free we are descendants of Abraham they said We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? (laughs) At which point I read this passage and I have to laugh. And it might not make sense to you, but whenever I read this, I laugh because I look at these people, these descendants of Abraham who happen to be Israelites. And I go, do you know your history? Do you know where you came from? You guys have been slaves to everyone. 
You all were slaves in Egypt. You were slaves to uh, Assyria and to Babylon. Currently, as we're speaking, you're slaves to Rome. You, you guys are slaves to everyone. And you don't know it. And that's the problem. That's the problem that Jesus is diagnosing in them. And it's actually the problem that he's diagnosing in us. Because we are, in fact, slaves. And we don't even realize what we're enslaved to. You see, we are slaves to whatever we obey, right? And oftentimes we turn to things other than God to be able to satisfy us, to make sense of this life, to be able to escape from this life. And by obeying these things, they actually lead to shame and they lead to disgrace and they lead to death. And I don't know what that happens to be for you. And I'm not trying to diagnose that in you because I have a feeling that you're actually pretty well aware of your sins and struggles in your own life. If we were to have that dialogue around the tables, well, I'm not gonna make you do, all right? But if we were to have that dialogue around the tables, you'd be able to list off several things that you know that are sin struggles with you, things that keep popping up, addictions and issues that you've had in your life. You know that they surround by greed and immorality and pride and all of those things that you have sought after in freedom to be able to not obey the righteous works of God, they've only led to further bondage. But you might not even recognize that what, that's what's happening right now. You might not even recognize the fact that you are enslaved. That's what it was with these people. And so Jesus continues on. He says, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is a part of the family forever. So if the son has set you free, then you are free indeed. If the son has come in and he has spoken to your indebtedness, then you are no longer in debt anymore. If you surrender to the son, then he's able to transform you from being a slave into a son. It's an amazing reality and transfer in this divine exchange that happens in this moment. And then he goes on to say, yes, I realize that you are descendants of Abraham. You're not telling me anything you knew. Yet some of you are trying to kill me because there's no room in your hearts for my message. It's a question I have to ask us this morning. I ask myself, is there room in your hearts for Jesus' message? Is there room in your hearts for Jesus' way? Is there room in your hearts to believe that maybe you don't know it all? That maybe your way is not the right way? That the freedom that you're seeking is not actually found in rebellion, but it's found in restriction. It's found in submission. It's found in me saying that I am no longer uh, in control of my life. Instead, I've given the keys of my life over to Christ. He is now the master and the Lord of my life. Is there room in your heart for that? Because if there is, then there's a possibility for you to actually experience true freedom. Because whether we know this or not, God's ways, though they don't always make sense, are always better. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is this, do you trust that God knows what's best? Because he's, he's instructed us He's given us all sorts of prescriptions and solutions and scriptures over the past couple weeks. His ways are better. They just seem like madness. But if you actually employ them, you get what you're looking for in the first place. Do you really trust God? If so, test a minute. Try it out. See if it's right. This has actually been a theme throughout the entire series that we've been looking at. God's instruction seems like madness, but God's ways are always the solution to the madness that we happen to be in. Which is why I think Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says it this way. He says, if it seems we're crazy, if it seems we're mad, if it seems we're out of our mind, it's to bring God glory. And if we're in our right minds, it's for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Christ's love compels us. One translation says it this way, Christ's love constrains us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his life will no longer live for themselves. They enslave themselves to Christ. Instead, they will live for him who died and was raised for them. You see, we have a, we have a hard time initially. Those that are not yet following after Jesus, those that have not yet experienced his love, we have a hard time initially surrendering our life to Jesus 
because we want to take hold of this. We believe that there's freedom in our decisions, right? And to be able to, to choose what we want. But when we see that a God who loves us enough to constrain himself, when we see a, a God that actually has put restraints on himself and has come to us in the form of a man who, who put himself and refrained himself to a body, a mortal body like our own that, that, was, that was subject to be able to die and to bleed and to hurt like we do, all of a sudden it makes it a little bit easier for us to be able to give that life over to him because we see that he's a God that's done that for us. Tim Keller and the reason for God puts it this way, he says, the love of Christ constrains us because once you realize how Jesus changed for you and he gave himself for you, then you aren't afraid of giving your freedom up and therefore finding your freedom in him. Every, every week that we get together, we don't just hear some messages from the, from the scriptures. We don't just discover some truths. We do so um, in a way that actually points to the, the very work of Jesus Christ on this earth for us. His death, burial, and resurrection. And, and, and our practice is to be able to do that around what's called the Lord's Supper or communion. And we, so we have these elements that represent his body and his blood. And if you're at a table or you're in the rows up here, you have those available to you. Go ahead and grab them. If you're here in the middle, we have a couple people that are gonna bring some elements to you. But this is the central part of the reason why um, believers all over the world gather. We do so not just to learn new instructions from Scripture, we do so because we thank God that he loved us enough to come to us in the first place. To offer up some constraints on the fact that, that even though he was God, in full nature God, he limited himself to this body and he suffered a death, not just any death, but a death on a cross, a humiliating, shameful thing. And in so doing, what he did was he actually restricted himself not only to the Father's will, but he restricted himself to our limitations. So when we take this, we not only say, thank you, God, for loving us and caring for us, but thank you for showing us the way that restriction is actually freedom. And so let's do that right now. Let's, let's take the bread that represents his body. It was broken for us on the cross. And we take the juice that represents the blood of a new covenant, a new way. Let's pray. Lord, you've, uh, you've offered us such great guidance. Uh, yet our, um, our intrinsic understandings, the things that kind of lead us away, that cause us to rebel, that somehow make us think that we know better, uh, they just get in the way, Lord. And we find ourselves rebellious and sinful and hurting and in chains. And Lord, you know better than any of us what those chains are in our life, what they look like. Whether it be greed or pride or some kind of sexual immorality or an addiction to something or distraction that we keep going to instead of going to you. Father, you know what those things are. And I pray that, that in this conversation today that there's conviction happening in people's hearts that they identify what those things are that they've been running after out of a rebellious spirit and a desire for freedom, but they would see that it only leads them to further bondage. And instead that they would turn and they would surrender, they would submit to you, they would repent, they would confess, and they would actually surrender and submit to your ways. And that you would show up in such a way that would actually create true freedom and peace and satisfaction in their life that they've been looking for. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we had a baptism earlier, but we also get to celebrate another one right now. Uh, another person who's come to submit their lives unto Christ and to say, I no longer live, but Christ lives into me. I'm dying to myself and I'm rising in Christ. And so let's watch this and celebrate it.